Good afternoon. I'm Andy Van Clunen, CEO of National Skills Coalition. Welcome to our latest fireside chat today with Mitch Landrew, Senior Advisor to President Biden and the Administration's Infrastructure Implementation Coordinator. Mitch Landrew knows something about both the promise and challenges of local infrastructure initiatives. He served as Louisiana's Lieutenant Governor until 2010 when he was elected Mayor of New Orleans. Mayor Landrieu took office while the city was still trying to recover from Hurricane Katrina and a stalled five-year rebuilding process. But he was able to fast track over a hundred projects and secure billions in federal funding for roads, schools, hospitals, parks, and other critical infrastructure. It was seen as a model turnaround. So when President Biden was looking for someone to head up his new federal infrastructure initiative, he turned to Mitch Landrieu who now oversees the implementation of the $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure law, the most significant infrastructure investment in a generation. So I'm gonna to talk to Mayor Landry today about what he's doing to make sure that the infrastructure plan isn't just investing in bricks and mortar and steel, but it's also investing in people, the people that we think should be part of a more diverse and inclusive skilled workforce. Then we're going to hear reflections from three local leaders who are already working in their communities to train residents for these infrastructure jobs to see if they think the Biden administration is on the right track. But first, let's talk to senior advisor to the president and infrastructure implementation coordinator, Mitch Landrieu. Mayor Landrieu, thanks for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, I know this has been an incredibly busy summer for you and the entire White House team. Uh, we saw each other uh, this past June at a White House meeting that you co-hosted with Ambassador Susan Rice from the Domestic Policy Council, Brian Deese from the National Economic Council, uh, and Labor Secretary Marty Walsh. The whole team was there to launch this new thing called the Infrastructure Talent Pipeline Challenge. And in the room with all of us were a lot of companies and unions and workforce development ex experts. So let's just start with this. What's the challenge about and how is it intended to impact who gets a chance to be part of rebuilding America's infrastructure? Well, Andy, first of all, thanks so much for having me. And thanks for being here at the White House with the president and, and his team uh, in June. I think everybody knows by now that this president, when he ran for office, said that he was going to use his power to lift people in the country up, to see people who have been left out and to make sure that nobody gets left behind. And you've now seen this play itself out in a dramatic fashion just recently uh, with the success of other, majors of piece, other major pieces of legislation. And when you put them all together, from the American Rescue Plan to the Infrastructure Act, which I'm responsible for implementing, to the CHIPS bill, which was designed to increase manufacturing back home, to the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, which is really the largest investment in climate, you really start to see the president's vision for the country starting to, to frame up, which is basically to say, hey, we're not the special interest. We, we are for uh, the people that built America, and we're going to build an economy from the bottom up and the middle out. And part of that overall vision is to make sure that the physical infrastructure in the country actually is something that helps people rather than hurts them, that unites them rather than divides them, and that prepares us for a future. But the president, when he, when he decided to push this infrastructure bill, which is a $1.2 trillion investment in our nation's infrastructure, said that he was going to use it to make sure that everybody got a job that needed a job that could work in this area. We weren't just going to build stuff the way it was. We were going to build it better. We were going to create a better America. And in his vision for a better America, he said that everything that we do should have equity as a lens to make sure that people that have gotten left out participate, that we ought to be building this with things that are made in America. We ought to be thinking about good paying union jobs. We ought to be thinking about climate. And when you do all of those things, it's not just the thing that you build, it's the way that you build it and it's who gets to build it and then who gets the benefit. So that's, the, that's really the big 40,000 foot lens. And of course, when you do something this big that the nation has not done in the last 60 years and arguably really not in our history, this is actually bigger than what FDR, Eisenhower did together, you have to start thinking, well, how are we going to do this? Actually, who's going to get the work done? And the way the bill is designed, there are investments on roads and bridges and airports and ports and waterways, high-speed internet, clean air, clean water, 
et cetera, et cetera. The idea here, though, is to work with states and local governments to get this done because 90 percent of this work is going to get done on the ground. So even though the federal government is funding it in almost 100 percent of the way, it's actually the mayors and the governors that are going to actually um, build it. And consequently, the people who live in the cities and the towns and the counties. Now, anybody who's kind of played around with this knows that you got a workforce challenge. Who are the people that are going to build it? Are they trained to do the thing that we're actually starting to do now that we haven't done before? The answer is not necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, is what's going on maybe in Colorado the same thing that might be going on in New Mexico? It might be going on in Maine. It might be going on in Florida or in South Dakota, North Dakota. The answer is no, because every area has different challenges and people have different skill sets. So um, the president asked us to get together and to really challenge all of the people who are going to be involved in this to come up with a national talent pipeline and to get all of the private sector partners, the faith-based partners, the not-for-profit partners together with labor, business, and of course, the federal, state, and local governments, and see if we could challenge everybody to go find the folks that need work, find the thing that they need to be trained for, find a way to set up a training mechanism to actually make that happen, and then to be part of a national effort that actually implements this what federal piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it's so true. It's the how you get it done and who gets a chance to be a part of it. I do believe, in addition to the scale of this investment, which is once in a generation, you're absolutely right. Um, but it's being very purposeful about who it is that we're going to get a chance to be part of this rebuilding effort. I think that's what really sets us apart from other right. transportation bills we've had, even other infrastructure bills that we've had in the past. Well, so you mentioned state and local officials, uh, mayors and governors and others. And so I want to go back a little bit uh, to when you were mayor, mayor of New Orleans. Uh, you know, you had come on after about five years of somewhat stalled recovery efforts following Hurricane uh, Katrina. Uh, and you had an infrastructure challenge that you needed to deal with as well. And so you did a number of things to jumpstart that rebuilding, not just dealing with those brick and mortar and steel issues, but also the people challenges, how you could get more New Orleans residents including its black residents to be part of the rebuilding. So now fast forward to today, you have a lot of local officials and other stakeholders and communities who are trying to figure out how it is that they're gonna start planning for these federal uh, infrastructure dollars that are gonna be coming uh, to their communities soon. What advice would you offer from that experience uh, 10 some years ago when you were leading that effort uh, in New Orleans? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a great question because when I was mayor of the city, for people who, who may not remember this, it got hit by Katrina. 250,000 homes were destroyed, 1,800 people were killed. Then we had Rita, which was another storm. Then we had Ike, then we had Gusoff, then we had the recession, then we had the BP oil spill. So we were really flat on our backs and we had to rebuild the, the city. And one of the problems is we had a lot of need and we had money, but we didn't necessarily have people. And then if we had people, in some instances, we had people coming from across the country to work, but people in the city were not working. So. It was really like, well, how do, the first question was, do we have a problem? The answer was yes. Secondly, how do we solve this problem? And third, who are the people that are going to solve it? So it's really kind of the same questions. I remember thinking a lot about, uh, and I call it the anchor strategy, or I call it the 12 o'clock at noon strategy, mm -hmm. which is there was a major institution in a city. When the, when the sun was at 12 o'clock, whatever shadow that building cast, anybody who worked in that neighborhood, ought to be working in that building, as opposed to the idea of people coming from parishes or, or counties outside, taking the taxpayer dollars and leaving. That wasn't really building a resilient, cohesive community. That was just people coming in, taking stuff and leaving and creating strife. So that was one kind of big idea that I started to think about. The other was to really go find the people that had been left behind that for some reason didn't know how to get to the job or the thing. And so we partnered with Strive, which is, you guys probably know about, but there's mm -hmm. lots of folks whose job it is to engage in soft skill training. Because a lot of folks, especially returning citizens, you know, what, weren't gonna get a second look. There was not a ban the box situation. So people were not really getting a good chance. So you bring all those these ideas up here, and now you've got something that's, you know, just huge, 1.2 trillion. So it's a lot of, there's a lot of cookies. Um, we should say it that way. Um, but, but what we notice up here is that it is a nat it is a national problem, but it is a local solution. And all I can tell you is that in New Orleans, the only way that we got anything done was through partnerships. 
And the partnerships are government absolutely have to be federal, state, and local. And of course, now you've got the federal government not only showing up, but they're the first ones at the table with the money trying to push down to the ground as fast as we can. So we've got the federal partners there. You got to get the governors who are going to spend a bucket load of money engaged in this so they can use their convening power to bring people together. Then you've got to get the mayors. And then on top of that, completely as importantly, you have to be able to reach into the community and you know, from, from the federal government, the mayors are on the ground, but anybody that goes into a city know the mayors are really not on the ground. The mayors are not always every day in every neighborhood, or if they are, they're not in all the neighborhoods. So who can reach into the neighborhoods? Who are the not-for-profits that have credibility? Who are the faith-based organizations that can actually bring them together? And then who are the businesses that are actually going to make sure that they, with intentionality, don't leave anybody out and go to people and not wait for them to come. And so that's really what the challenge is about. And so I know you guys have put a survey up. You can sign up for this challenge um, and being part of this civic engagement that we're talking about at the national level to find the people, to find the project, connect them to it, and then find the folks that are going to train them. Now, who's going to do this? The unions could do it. Um, you could have community and technical colleges do it. You could have other not-for-profits do it so long as they are training the folks for the jobs that we're going to have. And, of course, just to be very specific, we, we're laying fiber optic cable across the country. We need lots of people to do that. We are building uh, 500,000 electrical vehicle charging stations. We need people to do that. We're actually cleaning up rivers. We're cleaning up lakes. We're doing super fun, you know, cleanup. We need people to do that. And the list goes on and on and on. That's before you even get to building roads and bridges and the construction work that comes. So there's going to be tons of jobs and we've got to find the people, connect them and then train them and then make sure they have a sustainable income over their life so they can build generational wealth. Yeah, that is huge. And the idea of those, you mentioned partnerships and I want to come back to that, but I do find that sometimes, um, and I don't know whether this is part of your experience locally, but sometimes the partners that have the ideas about how we get new folks into these jobs, how we train them, how we can get them invested in and in, in now so that they're ready when the building starts. Sometimes they're kind of brought in at the end of the process, as opposed to kind of like, let's figure this out in the beginning. Like as we're trying to figure out how we're going to rebuild this uh, sewage plant or how we're going to rebuild this bridge or whatever, who are all the players that we need to have at the table? And a lot of them are the folks you mentioned, community organizations, community colleges, unions, right. workforce boards, others. Um, and we're really hoping that that's going to be the different way that this infrastructure bill is being approached. I think we would be a real step forward from how we've done some of these things in the past. Right. Well, let me speak to that for a second. I, you know, having been a, a local government guy, you know, when I came up to Washington, it's a big thing up here and it's confusing and all the cabinet officers didn't talk to each other, which is one of the reasons why I think the president brought me in to try to help mm -hmm. on the federal level, break down the silos between and amongst, in this instance, for example, the Department of Labor, the Department of Commerce, Department of Interior, Department of Agriculture, the FCC, so I've convened um, with my partner, Brian Deese, who's the head of the Economic Council, um, and Susan Rice, all the cabinet secretaries, 14 different times. And they're all partnering together on the federal level. But I also knew, because I was a local guy, that there was a layer between the local folks and, and us, and that was the governors. So at the president's request, I've communicated with all of the governors, and I've asked them to appoint an infrastructure coordinator themselves mm -hmm. so that they could all of the agencies on the state level, and then I'll talk to all the mayors. So we have one flat organization that represents the partnership between the federal, state, and local governments. Now, one, you get a little humility when you come to Washington if you didn't have it before you got here, and you have to understand that not one size, one size does not fit all. Right. For example, what might be, you know, happening in North Dakota is not necessarily happening on the streets of New Orleans. So you really have to rely on the governor and the mayors to use their convening power to bring together their business leaders, their faith-based leaders, who may be different than someplace else. And they might be building a different thing there. So it's really important for us to engage them, not tell them what to do, but use the convening power of the White House, like we did, and you came mm -hmm. to it. And you saw some of the business leaders there who said, oh, wow, I don't have to wait. For the I can go do this now. And so we're hoping, again, that they're starting this very, very early, because we're certainly not dictating it. We're just lifting up to people that we got a huge challenge and that the solution is in the communities in America, and it is a fantastic opportunity to put people to work. Look, at a time when the unemployment rates are lowest, 
are going to be an issue. And so let's not wait, you know, to figure out, you know, a year from now, let's get ready and let's make sure we connect people. And we're very intentional about it. And I'll just finally say this. Um, you know, the, the good book says, seek and you shall find. If you go look for folks who are there, you'll find them. If you don't go look for them, don't know how to look for you, you can't ever find them. So that's why we say you have to be intentional about this. And on top of that, it is this president's view that diversity is this nation's greatest strength. The workforce is changing. People of color have to be let in. Women have to be let in. They have to have the tools necessary to get in. They have to have the training. And when they do that, they build generational wealth. They're going to really push this country, you know, as, 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 as far ahead and as fast as the country, you know, hasn't seen in quite a long time. Yeah, absolutely. And I and that idea of making sure that it's not just going to happen, we need to make it happen. So let's start working on it now. And I agree with you. The companies that were at that uh, that meeting that you convened in June, they were big corporations, Bechtel, AT&T. They clearly were ready to go. I want to talk about another partner that I think is a key part of this, which is a lot of small and medium-sized companies, right? Their partnerships are a little bit different, but they need to be part of this effort as well. And I'm and I'm sure that you agree with me that having industry partnerships on the ground where they are part of figuring out how this is going to happen in their communities is going to be an essential part of the solution as well. Well, well look, you mentioned the big guys that were there. Bechtel was there. Corning was there. AT&T was there. These are all the big heavy hitters. But, you know, most people work for small businesses, right? Um, and it really connection on the ground that matters. I'm, I'm looking at a, I'm looking down a bit at my notes. But Brian Stewart, who's the CEO of Superior Group, is an electrical contract in Ohio, is putting a group together. Daryl McKissick, you know, who's one of the owners of the Black Women-Owned Construction Firm, McKissick and McKissick is doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, the truth is, you need the big guys, but you actually need the small guys, you know, as an important way. I'll, I'll lift up an antidote for you. I used to be the lieutenant governor of Louisiana, um, and there's a, a there's a city called Lake Charles, which is really kind of at the heel of the boot, which is right next to Texas. Mm-hmm. They have a uh, they had a community college there uh, that that was a training center for the oil and gas industry at the time and for Northrop Grumman. They retrofitted um, the interior of, of planes that we fly on, um, and they trained people to work on the rigs when the rigs were blowing and going back in the day. And when you walked into this community college, it was called Suella. The classroom was actually the same physical space that folks worked on when they went into the field. So the, literally the second these young people graduated, they had a job waiting for them mm-hmm. and they were trained specifically to do the thing, right, that they had gone to school for. And it was a perfect link match to match. When I was in the city of New Orleans and, and Katrina hit and we were really at our worst there were 38,000 African-American men between the ages of 24 and 40 that were not working. Mm-hmm. They weren't working. And so my mission was, okay, I want them to have a chance to work. So how do we design something to fix that problem? Mm-hmm. So I, that's a ground up as opposed to the federal government saying, I need you to do this. You go figure it out. You're like, look, in our community, this is who needs jobs. These are the skill. This is how they're going to get the skills. This is what they're going to produce. And again, it's like I said, across the country, all these things are going to be different depending on what the particular investments are in the other states, whether it's the brownfield sites or cleaning up the lakes or rebuilding the grids or putting the EV charging stations down or roads and bridges, airports and ports mm-hmm. uh, or high speed. It'll be different everywhere in the country. Yeah. Well, and I, yes. And having making sure that we're giving folks the tools on the ground to make those decisions, that seems to be a really important part of it and making sure that everybody's at the table to figure out how to do that. So listen, yeah, I know you're really, important. oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Mayor. I'm just saying it's the most important thing. I mean, the federal government's providing the money, but we're not, we're not, we're not rowing the ship. We're just steering right. it. And, we, and we're providing guidance. And we believe that the best ideas come from the ground up and, and from the small businesses in America and the community and the, and the organizations that are in the communities in America that produce what we call social resilience. Because we're interested in not just physically rebuilding the country, but building a better America. And if you use the money and you use the educational opportunities, you will be producing um, a, a, a generation of people that are growing wealth, growing ingenuity that will, will live way beyond the bridge you know, that we build or the EV charging station that we lay down. That's what the president means when he says building a better America. Absolutely, absolutely. 
So look, I know you're busy. I know you're busy collecting commitments. We've got a lot of partnerships in our network that I know are, are saying that they're gonna rise to the president's challenge on this. And I hope you're gonna get a lot of that from all over the country. But as you're looking forward, what are other things that you've got, that you've got to know that you've got to take care of as well over the next few months to make sure that we're getting enough folks trained, we're getting enough folks into quality jobs and that this implementation uh, act is going to be a, a huge success? Well, we're really excited about the involvement of all the cabinet secretaries. There's money in the bill to help with workforce training and development in each one of the different areas, whether it's the Department of Labor or the Department of Energy or the Department of Commerce. Uh, all of the secretaries are in this. Of course, you have participated in a roundtable of business leaders and labor leaders and not-for-profits. We're going to continue to do that. As I said to you, I continue to communicate with the governors you know, um, fairly frequently, as well as the infrastructure coordinators. And so we're going to keep pushing really, really hard. On top of that, the president has passed these other bills as well that people should be aware of because there are massive amounts of money in those bills as well to create jobs. So it's not just the infrastructure law. It's the Inflation Reduction Act that's got all the money in it for climate. You, you have the CHIPS bill. Um, you have the burn pit bill that was for the, for the veterans. All of those things are going to create lots of different kinds of jobs that we're staying focused on and giving that information to folks like you and, other, and others that can help us make sure that the public knows about it, gets ready for it, starts developing training centers in their communities, and then finds the folks that actually are doing the work. So I don't, I don't want people to forget to go to the survey um, and to make sure they sign up for the challenge um, and, and be part of this great effort that the president has called us to. Will do. And I will make sure that before uh, this session is over that folks get uh, where they can get the information about the challenge and where they can sign up because we want to make sure that everyone who's watching this is going to be part of that solution. So Mayor Landrieu, I want to thank you, not just you, the whole White House team, everybody in the Biden administration, as you said, this is an all agency effort to try to bring everybody together. And I know you're the one who is in charge of making that happen. So for everyone who is being uh, leading this uh, on behalf of the Biden administration, I just wanna thank you for that. And I really appreciate your coming and sharing with me some of that effort today so we can get it out to the folks in our network. Well, Andy, just th thanks to you and to your team and to all the folks that are participating um, today. There's $1 billion of funding uh, in this overall bill for workforce training. And, and my partner, Susan Rice and Brian Deese, and then of course, Marty Walsh at Labor are all working on this with all of the other cabinet secretaries. So I want to challenge all of you guys that are watching and participate. You can sign up on the survey uh, that Andy is going to show you guys. And so let's make sure we put America back to work. Thanks so much and God bless. Thanks, Mayor Landrieu. Good talking to you. Sure enough. Now let's turn to three local leaders who themselves have already responded to the president's challenge and have been training folks for infrastructure careers in their communities, some of them for years. What do they think about what they've just heard from Mayor Landrieu? Joining me today are Kelly Kupkak, Executive Director of Oregon Trades Women. Hey, Kelly. Hey, Andy, thanks for having us. Good to have you here. Uh, Liza Smitherman, who's Chief People Officer of Jostin Construction in Cincinnati, Ohio and a member of NSC's Business Leaders United Network. Hey, Liza. Hey, Andy, good to see you and thanks for having us. Oh, good to have you here as well. And Donnie Jones, he's the Chief Operating Officer of the Chamber of Commerce of West Alabama and Executive Director of West Alabama Works. Hey, Donnie. Glad to be here with you, Andy. Good to have you all here. Okay, so you heard what Mayor Landrieu had to say about the administration's efforts to make sure that we're not just investing in capital infrastructure, but we're investing in people. I'm curious to see what your initial reactions are to some of what Mayor Landrieu had to say. Do you think the administration is on the right tack with some of this? Kelly, let me start with you first. Thanks, Sandy. Yeah, absolutely. I really appreciate uh, the Biden administration's commitment to equity and certainly Mayor Landrieu's leadership in the space around centering equity in our nation's infrastructure investments. And as everyone on this panel knows, this is a historic time and a historic investment. And certainly um, coming through the pandemic, we have seen that women and people of color were disproportionately impacted by COVID economically and in the workforce. And so for us at Oregon Tradesmen, we're very excited to be part of this conversation and part of this critical work of getting folks back to work, but with an equity lens. So we think that this is the right path and the right strategy. Thanks, Kelly. 
Liza, you're running a, a local construction company there in Cincinnati. How did this resonate with anything that you're trying to do? Thanks, Andy. I will tell you from what Mayor Landrieu said, the thing that stuck out to me, he said, find the people. He said, seek and you shall find. Mm -hmm. And I think that in so many ways, as, as Kelly just shared, as the work for the work that we're doing here in the Cincinnati tri-state region, um, we are very much about how we can support both talent and, and folks out there who are looking for work, as well as how we can support, support employers in looking at work and their talent pipeline through an equity lens. So I very much could connect to and relate to, and I'm very happy to be a part of the work that we're doing here locally that very much aligns with the, the uh, needs and the desires of the White House. Excellent. And Donnie, how about you? You're trying to do this from both an economic development perspective as well as a workforce development perspective there in West Alabama. What did you hear from the administration that makes sense? Well, the things that I really resonated with me is the fact that um, Mayor Landry really um, spoke about the fact that we're investing and in, in going to have over a billion dollars that are going to be poured into workforce development. And all of the billions of dollars that are going to be poured into infrastructure, what we've got to make sure is that we have our act together on the ground to make sure that we have the workforce, because it doesn't matter how much money you pour into it if you don't have the workers to actually produce uh, the infrastructure to you, the electricians, the, the linemen, the, the construction workers, all of that's going to play in. And it's going to be so important to for us as communities to work together to actually make sure that the workforce infrastructure is actually built as we build out the infrastructure for our country. Yeah, absolutely. Like we we can't just have shovel ready projects. We have to have people ready projects as well. And it takes a while to get folks ready to, to join a new occupation, to join a new sector. And it seems like something that we should be doing now, even if some of those federal dollars haven't, haven't hit the ground yet in our communities. Well, so I do wanna talk a bit about what you all have been doing uh, in your local areas on some of these issues. As I said, this is not something new that you're responding to. This is something that you've all been doing in many different ways uh, for years, but we have a new context with this once in a generation investment in uh, federal investment in infrastructure. Um, so Kelly, I want to come to you to talk a little bit. You mentioned in your initial comments about the president's focus on equity, Mayor Landrieu's comments on that. And clearly like that was something that your organization, Oregon Tradeswomen, was founded to address. Um, and I should mention that all of you, I, should, I, I think I said at the top, you've all made commitments to the talent pipeline challenge already. So I both want you to talk a bit about Kelly why Oregon Trades One was set up the way it was and how that is going to feed into what you're going to do in terms of the things you're trying to do to respond to the president's challenge to train folks for these new infrastructure jobs. Yeah, absolutely, Andy. I mean, Oregon Trades One was set up in 1989 to help get more women into the skilled construction trades. And we are still looking at national numbers, right, where women are still very uh, underrepresented and also people of color and in particular women of color in the skilled trades, which offer, especially in a union pathway, an opportunity for a lifetime of economic security and a career that can help support themselves and their families. The work we're doing here, we run a pre-apprenticeship training program that is at no cost to adult job seekers in our community. So that's what we're doing at a very you know, micro level. But at the state level, we are very lucky to have the leadership of Governor Kate Brown who through her vision and implementation of a racial justice council has also focused on business and small business opportunities for growth with infrastructure and workforce development opportunities for women, people of color and returning citizens, right? So really focusing all of the work at the state level as well from an infrastructure standpoint in equity. And we're very proud to be part of that. I think it's important to say too that as a small nonprofit doing workforce development, we're also very involved in those conversations at the state level. But at the federal level, we are part of the National Task Force on Tradeswomen Issues. And we developed 10 points for equity and infrastructure, which we shared with the Biden, infra uh, Biden administration early on. And that work leads all of our sister organizations across the country who are doing workforce development not only to get women in that pipeline and as Liza said you know we we do need to up you know not only help the folks that are already in 
the talent pipeline, but bring more folks in and help them be successful so that employers uh, like Liza's company and others can have skilled, qualified workforce that represent our communities. That's great. You mentioned the state of Oregon. It, um, some folks wouldn't know this, but you know, we have had a lot of other federal transportation bills in the past and things like that, where there was investments in capital infrastructure. And there was always an option to use some of that money to invest in training folks for, for those jobs. It's rarely done. Oregon is one of the few standout states that actually has made a commitment to do that. I'm curious how that has impacted your ability to bring more folks into the industry because the state has taken that seriously. You know, Andy, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up that example because it's certainly something that other state Department of Transportations can uh, employ as a strategy for equity and economic investment in our community and in job seekers and in the talent pipeline through the Federal Highway Administration, the on-the-job training supportive services, or sometimes known as OJT uh, for short. Uh, those dollars are allocated to every state Department of Transportation and that the the legislation speaks to grounding that in equity, right? And building small businesses, businesses of color, businesses led by women, but also specifically for creating diversity in the workforce. And so in Oregon, uh, our Department of Transportation through an interagency agreement with our Bureau of Labor and Industries really leads utilizing those dollars in very impactful ways. So organizations like Oregon Tradeswomen can run pre-apprenticeship training programs, but also just as importantly, ensuring that we have dollars available for support services and retention services. So as you might imagine during COVID, we used a lot of those dollars to stabilize workers, right? Who had to leave work because they couldn't put their kids in daycare or school. Um, but in building a talent pipeline, those dollars are incredibly valuable. And Oregon's also been using those for childcare, as we know, not just women, but all working families, all working people um, who have children have a need. And sadly, Oregon is the third most expensive state in the in the nation for childcare costs. And so that's been really fundamental for helping us to not only get folks in, but keeping folks in by providing uh, those workforce development and support services. So there is a policy fix here. And, and I think that what we want to do as National Skills Coalition is we want to lift up those kinds of examples to say, these are the kinds of things that we want the administration to be encouraging. And we want our states then to be taking advantage of these opportunities to make sure that we're thinking about not just how to rebuild infrastructure, but how to use the resources available from a variety of different ways to get more folks into these trades in a way that's going to be good, not just for the projects that we're building today, but is creating a more diverse and inclusive workforce across a range of different parts of our infrastructure moving forward into the future. So there clearly is a policy part of this, and I'm glad that we're all working together on some of that. I wanna turn now to just kind of like some things on the ground. So Liza, you're running a company, right? So you've got, a, you've got construction projects that you're in charge of or that you're, that you're working in part, in part of, um, but you're not just building structures, you're also building some partnerships with other folks in your industry, with other local stakeholders, and that's kind of gonna been a key part of how it is that we're trying to diversify the infrastructure workforce there in Cincinnati. Why do you think that that is so important to what you're trying to do as a, as a company owner operator? And is that something that, we, that other cities should be taking a look at? Yeah, that's a great question, Andy. And I can tell you from the perspective of an employer, um, it is important because we are in our businesses, we're a small to medium sized business. We've been in business for almost 25 years, which is shocking to say. Um, and we have really relied on the partnerships and the resources that are, are available to us as employers in this industry. And I am well aware in other industries where the talent pipeline has um, not completely dried up, but it has become very challenging for all of us, no matter what the sector industry that we are in, to fill the open positions that we have. What I am doing and have been able to be a part of over the last 10 plus years, as you mentioned um, earlier, is just be part of some of these partnerships that have existed for many, many years where we have engaged in, and, and pulled together community-based organizations. We have pulled together employers. We've pulled together uh, educational institutions, vocational ed and whatnot. 
and convened all of us together to really talk about what are some of the concerns, the issues, the challenges, and the potential solutions to that. What has evolved here in our region is my um, opportunity to be part of more of the really the employer side and how we as a, um, a region can be more inclusive in our practices as it pertains to attracting people into our organizations and into our businesses. So I am now um, a part of an organization that's connected to our local chamber, our regional chamber, I should say, called the Workforce Innovation Center. And in that, this is an organization and a, and a consultancy really practice where we can really convene solutions um, driven organizations and as well as really be a thought leader around inclusive capitalism something I'm thinking all of you have heard of in some way, shape, or form. And so everything that Kelly shared and Donnie uh, alluded to as well, and even Andy, when I saw um, and was able to um, listen in on the, the interview you had with the mayor, how you talk about and that need for more diversity in thought and, and in practice, as well as just the folks that we can draw into our, our businesses and organizations so that we can um, provide training, so that we can build more generational wealth for all folks um, is really the playing field that we want to be a part of. So with the Workforce Innovation Center and the work that we're doing here regionally, we are have created this talent ecosystem where we really connect businesses to those different organizations, those institutions, um, the, the workforce investment boards that can provide support to employees, to people who, just what Kelly was talking about, um, employees who are not only women that need childcare, as I sat through a, a meeting with an employee yesterday who is a father of seven children and it's the first week of school and he had to get his daughter to school, which made, made for his being tardy to work. And so an example of that, but how the center supported even our business and helping us review our policies and practices internally to say, how can we be more inclusive and be more agile in how and what the expectations are of our employees. So what, what this work is about um, providing employers the opportunity to really showcase the work and the and the opportunities that are available back to what Mayor uh, Landrieu said, find the people. Well, the people want to come to places where they feel like they are, are accepted, where there um, is, is um, a reason to understand when I have to take my daughter to school and I need to be 30 minutes later. So my start time, can that be adjusted? Where we as employers can showcase that that we, we are open and, and want and are available to employ folks and can make some, some adjustments as uh, is needed. And then again, it also helps us as employers who are trying to run our business, we need our people, we need people. So what are the resources out there that can help support us in that? So I've been really fortunate to be able to be on the side of how this is really, this foundation has been built and how now as an employer, we can support other employers through the work of the center and the ecosystem that exists within our region. Andy, could I just, if I could, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just want to respond to Liza because I wanted to say, as a workforce development community-based organization, we really appreciate employers like you who are involved in these conversations and thinking strategically, but also willing to look at your own internal practices, right? So when we're talking about equity, it isn't just saying, hey, the, you know, this is a nice word on a piece of paper in a document or a policy. It's really about action and what kinds of actions we can take. And to your point earlier, Andy, it takes all of us working collaboratively, right? So that business, workforce, job seekers, and community organizations can lift up these strategies that work yes. together because it shouldn't be a burden on, on employers, right? We should be working together for solutions. You're absolutely right. And I'm sorry, Andy, I just to respond to that, I think that again, the work that's being done because we've had such a great foundation because of the work that National Skills has done, that introduction into our region of that work and business leaders uh, united and being able to talk about and compare what kind of challenges that we all have. That's the, the, the center has really kind of been birthed from a lot of that work that has happened. And um, to again, engage job seekers, engage you know, your current workforce and what is are the needs that 
they are um, having to face and, and are challenged with and how can we as, as employers meet those needs. That's going to impact the pipeline. That's going to affect the work that is available and that we all want to be able to be a part of because we do have the people. We will seek and find and retain. Right, and retain. That's right. And I think this kind of points out, you know, because, and as Mayor Landry acknowledged, um, while, you know, at the White House level, they've often been engaging some national and international employers, it's really going to be local companies like Johnson Construction that's going to be doing the majority of hiring, uh, not just in infrastructure jobs, but in all of the sectors where it is that we know that we need to be investing in more, uh, more folks to, to build a, a bigger skilled workforce pipeline. And so, Having that infrastructure, having that ecosystem, as you said, um, uh, Liza, where companies can kind of slot into that with other companies and other stakeholders, they don't need to create that on their own. It's something they can kind of solve collectively. It allows when there's opportunities like this where folks can kind of ramp things up and, and are ready. And communities that have got that in place are in a good situation. We need to build those kinds of partnerships and ecosystems in other communities as well. And so, Donnie, I want to turn to you because you know you mentioned earlier, like, we want to build the workforce infrastructure here in West Alabama, as well as building the road and build, you know, the street and, and bridge infrastructure and other parts of the physical infrastructure. Um, let's talk a bit about, you know, when Mayor Landrew came in as mayor at New Orleans, um, Katrina had kind of stalled uh, in terms of the rebuilding uh, efforts there in the city. And he kind of figured like, how is it that we can speed this up? How can we get the projects off the ground? How we can get the people into the jobs? particularly people here in our city. And I know that this is something that you're doing with, I know you're kind of make, breaking land speed records there in West Alabama in terms of what you're trying to do, both from the economic development side and from the workforce side. Talk a little bit about that, how, to, how that is, how you're able to do that in the context of some of these federal dollars that are now coming down um, from Washington. Well, you know, first of all, you've got to build the, um, I guess you'd say the bedrock of your ecosystem, your workforce ecosystem. And that's one thing that we've been blessed here in West Alabama. Um, we do have a, um, a governor, uh, Governor Ivey, uh, several years ago actually set forth um, her Success Plus plan. And through that, to make sure that we have enough over a half a million uh, skilled trade credentialed uh, citizens that are ready for jobs. And, and fortunately, we have been able to begin that work even before COVID hit. But what we're seeing is it's so important for those who are listening um, to this fireside chat to understand that if we're just having conversations, that is a wonderful place to start. But at some point, we have to move into actionable items and results. I'll give you a prime example. Over the last couple of years, we talk a lot about equity and inclusion, but if you build your infrastructure, your trust among your partners, um, your processes, we're really big on that here um, to actually get the outcomes that are needed. We're not talking about in, in the workforce needs that we're discussing, it's not your tens and twenties and thirties, it's your 100s and thousands that our processes have to be focused on. If you do that, you're going to begin to see the rising tide floating all boats. And Liz, I'm not just saying that about football, I'm talking really about workforce. But as we begin to look at that, over the last couple of years and the thousands that we have placed, we did a study uh, for one of our, our grants uh, a few weeks ago, over 80% of all of the people that we have placed in the last two years during COVID in high demand jobs, and we're talking about thousands, we're talking about Mercedes, BF Goodrich, a lot of our large manufacturers, our healthcare centers, um, 80, over 80% 80 were minority. Now, when you look at that and the outcomes and how that's gonna transform our education models, how we're doing training and all of that, and the collaboration and communication that's taking place around those conversations because of those outcomes, it's actually gonna transform our ability to move very quickly, to be able to do things that we've never done before. For example, we received uh, some of the CARES Act money just a few months ago from our county commission and focusing on student jobs. That's something that we haven't talked a lot about, but we have got to prepare the pipeline and how do we get more workers uh, from the non-participation rate? The best way to do that is to never let them get into the non-participation rate, actually getting them into jobs at a young age. So we developed in a matter of two months an entire software system that actually connects the students through the school systems and then connects them to jobs with navigators that are actually working with them online and through our tech systems to actually help them get jobs. 
Um, glad to say that because of that success, they've given us more CARES Act money, and we're developing the same system for those individuals in our community, in our region uh, that has a felony. And so many times those individuals, those parts of our citizenship don't feel like they have a chance. And that's why our recidivism rates across this country are so high. But if we can get them in good paying jobs, matter of fact, uh, we have another program that we just launched three months ago with the DA's office. And we're using, like Kelly was talking about earlier, programs like word-based learning and on-the-job training. And then um, actually working with our community college system to do ready-to-work training, which uh, the mayor actually talked about that, soft skills, essential skills, employability skills. In doing that, the normal second chance programs to get felonies expunged off of records, the repayment is on average around 25% and actually completing that. In our model that we've just launched, there is, I just heard from the DA's office this week, a 95% repayment and success rate. Now that is huge when you talk about it, but when you connect people to jobs, that really signifies, we get into a lot of rhetoric in workforce and we talk about all of these different uh, buzzwords, but here's the word that we really need to be talking about, hope. When you bring a job and you bring opportunity to families and community members and to the community as a whole, it brings hope and brings back that community spirit, that um, hope of a future, all of these things that we talk about a lot of times in political terms, but when it comes down to it, we work every single day with people and hope is what drives people to the next level. And so in doing that, we have an incredible opportunity uh, with the money that's gonna be driven down and the opportunity with, with our federal government and our state governments working hand in glove. But here's the bottom line, and I think the mayor said this, it's gotta take place on the local level. It's not about the federal government or anybody else telling communities how they need to do things. Those communities have to figure it out themselves. And they also have to figure out how to work together as a workforce family, not worrying about egos or silos, worried about people and taking care of the customer, which is our employers across this great country. They're the ones that are invested in our communities and they're opening up jobs and opportunities and the opportunity for hope we need to fill those jobs and give people hope and get them trained and get them prepared for the next opportunity in their lives. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it, Andy. That's really, <laughs> sorry, I, I hate to it's get a great on story, Donnie. Yeah. Very I, inspiring. Very absolutely. Donnie, I, and if I, oh, go, go ahead. Kelly. No, go ahead, Liza. Well, I was going to say, Donnie, I appreciate that. I just was reading an article about hope. And I think when we talk about hope, it's not this thing that's out there in the universe that we can, we wish for, but that it's something that's real, it's tangible, it's systemic kinds of, or system kinds of change that people can, they can see, they can touch, they can feel. It's actionable items that we see results from. So I can truly, I appreciate the term and the, and the, and the spirit in which you speak it, which is we want to see real tangible system kinds of change happening within our workforce ecosystem, within right. our talent ecosystem for our talent ecosystem. That's so right. thank, thank you for saying, that. You know, thank you for saying that. And back to what Kelly was saying earlier, you know, one of the things that we really focus on and we've worked with the Federal Reserve Bank um, out of Atlanta to really do a lot of studying on the, um, the effects of the benefits cliff. And, you know, mm -hmm. when we talk about child care and all those things, that's the other ways that we can get our local and state elected officials engaged. How do we bridge those, the, the divide when a cliff happens in a person's life, whether it's transportation, child care, or affordable workforce housing? Those are the three barriers that we have to work for uh, on politically and, mm -hmm. and locally. And so... Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of work needs to be done, but but I'm very encouraged by what we're hearing. Donnie, I'm, I'm really glad that you said that. And like Liza, I appreciate you using the word hope too, because we talk about systems change, we talk about structural change, we talk about programs and policies, but it is centered in hope, right? For the folks that we're serving, but it also, when we are working collaboratively to shift policy, to shift practices, to shift programs, and implementing quality jobs, right? You talked, Donnie, about the many folks you've put to work with 
high road employers in your state and your community, high road employers like Liza's company that are not just hiring folks and keeping them in the pipeline, but also committing to shifting their own practices, right? That are, that are about equity also, right? So to me, it, the work that we're doing here at Oregon Tradeswomen and, and like all of us across the country, we look at how many, for us in particular women, almost 14 million women are heading households that live in poverty in our nation which in 2022 is just astounding to me that that is uh, still happening. But through this moment in time with this infrastructure investment, we can help shift families out of poverty into prosperity with a shared prosperity model, right? Through the infrastructure investments, if we're doing it thoughtfully around those long-term changes to our systems and to pu public policy and how we do this work that like you said, Donnie, will make all, you know, high tides will rise all those ships, right? And we're talking about people and businesses and, and families and communities, right? The moment is now. Mm -hmm. Well, you three give me great hope. If we can get more of you and the commitments that you've made around the implementation of this infrastructure bill, we can have this replicated around the country. This is gonna be a generation changer. We're not just gonna have great shiny infrastructure. We're gonna have thousands, hundreds of thousands of changed lives because we've created some opportunities for folks to be able to grasp that hope and to move into a career that's gonna support them, it's gonna support their families and gonna bring real shared prosperity to their local communities. So I can't thank you all enough for the work that you are doing in your communities on these issues. I do wanna also say, you know, to Liza's point, it's not just hope, like there's work to be done. And I know that you all are working very hard uh, and we wanna make sure that we're creating as many opportunities as possible for you and others like you to be able to do this in the context of the infrastructure bill. Um, but it also is important to recognize that there's other resources that are already here. As, as, as Donnie said, we're using CARES Act money. Folks are using American Rescue Plan money. There are dollars that have been in some communities now for quite a while that are available. We could start investing in people now before the first dollar of infrastructure money actually shows up into your community. So when it does happen, the plans are in place to make sure that we're building lives as well as building infrastructure in our local community. So thank you so much for everything that you're doing and everything that you share today. And I hope, I know that you're gonna provide some inspiration for more folks to do what you've done, to step up to this uh, talent pipeline challenge so that we can send the message to Washington that there are folks on the ground that are ready to work in partnership together to make sure that we're including people and in how it is that we rebuild America. So thank you so much for everything that you share today and for everything that you're doing out there in your, in your neighborhoods and communities. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Andy. Have a great afternoon. You too. Yeah. You too. Thanks again to Kelly, Liza, and Donnie, and to Mayor Landrew for all that they're doing to make sure that we leverage these historic investments in infrastructure so that we're not just rebuilding our country, but we're rebuilding lives, rebuilding hope, and giving folks a chance to not just be a part of their community's future, but to have a career that's going to help them support themselves and their families. Uh, done properly, these capital investments are going to bring more quality jobs, greater equity, equity, and hopefully long-term industry partnerships into our local communities around the country. It's pretty inspiring stuff. Now, if you feel inspired by what you've heard today, I have two things that I'd like to ask you to do. First, we need as many local partnerships as possible. Employers, unions, community organizations, community colleges, workforce boards, to, to sign up for the President's Talent Pipeline Challenge, just as Kelly, Liza, and Donnie have already done. We wanna show Washington that this audience cares deeply about the need to invest in people as part of this infrastructure bill's implementation. And the more names we get on that pledge form demonstrates that this is something that folks outside of Washington see as an important part of how the bipartisan infrastructure law is implemented. So go to our website, uh, you, you can find uh, on our homepage on nationalskillscoalition.org, a scrolling image at the top that has a button that says sign the pledge. Put your name on that. We're gonna share that information with Mayor Landrieu and the rest of the White House team. And second, while you're on our website, if you haven't done it already, sign up for our email list so that you'll have knowledge about other opportunities to engage policymakers on these issues in the future, as well as notification about some future fireside chats including some conversations we're going to have with other members of the White House's cabinet about how this infrastructure and other federal recovery efforts are going to be implemented in the future. I hope you'll join me for those as well. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>